Scarborough Town Council meeting to order. Um, and would everybody stand? Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Councilor Holbrook? Here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Benedict? Here. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Okay, before we start general public comments, I'd like uh, to mention a couple of things. I'm calling for a workshop September 3rd to deal with Order 1453, which is uh, the cell phone transmission tower ordinance. Um, from a lot of comments from the public, emails, and uh, the planning board, we've decided that uh, we should take this up in a joint session with the planning board to consider all your comments that has been made over the past uh, weeks and uh, also their concerns. So that workshop will take place September 3rd uh, at 6 o'clock before the uh, regular town council meeting. The uh, second thing um, that we received a lot of comments on already is uh, order number uh, 1476, the uh, Memorandum of Understanding mm -hmm. for FOSH, um, which is to do with a uh, indoor yeah. hockey rink um, placed on town property. We'll also be doing a workshop on that October 1st um, at 6 o'clock before the regular meeting. Um, there will be a workshop between the council and the members of FOSH um, for further information. And um, Bo I, um, I suspect that uh, during the meeting, um, after discussion and public comments on those two items, that the uh, members of the council um, will offer an amendment to table at that time. At these um, two workshops, a, f a later date will be set to uh, have a second reading of the amendments that are made to um, the ordinance for cell phone towers and the agreement with uh, FOSH. Okay, so before we start, I'd like uh, my fellow Boy Scouts <coughs> that are here tonight to approach the podium and tell the public why you're here tonight. Introduce and introduce yourself with your name. Uh, I'm Jackson Obar. My name's Nate Taggart. I'm Daniel Bowen. I'm Mark Smith. Okay, Mark, while you're there, why don't you tell <laughs> us why you're here? <laughs> why are the four of you here tonight? Uh, we're here for a uh, community, community citizenship in the community merit badge. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, uh, so we'll start with uh, general public comments and uh, name and address in three minutes. Martin Tripp, 26 Oceanwood. Uh, just so everybody's got it, there, there's going to be an infrastructure build out in the country, and if nobody knows about it, they're going to do it, and I think after November, there's going to be a tax increase on gasoline. I think 10 to 20 percent myself, but that's only one thought. And with this infrastructure in Congress today, they're talking about a change in the way they define uh, the pension rules and, and the rest of it which is a little complex, but that's another $16 billion. Your taxes are going to go up. There's only one avenue to restrict taxes that is in this town, and that's by our own efforts to hold the tax down. This infrastructure build-out is going to hit a lot of people, and it's 10 to 20 cents, I'll bet you, after the election for your gas. I'm just bringing this up. Be careful. We need to be watchful. And then my second item, 
is the corner of Black Point Road and Eastern Trail, that intersection. The town people have put grass right up to within six inches of the highway. This grass has barely started. The stuff that was started six weeks ago is up three feet. They planted more right up to within six inches. The only thing from the roadway to the grass line is the curb. This is going to impede your line of sight. You may not see it this year. You will see it next year. Or this grass could be four or five feet high. Well, it's not a good idea to have done this. And unfortunately, the test is whether I'm right and they did a really bad idea here is the number of accidents that this is going to cause. <clears throat> I think this is a deadly situation that they've put in here. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, the people that do the planning for these kind of items, even over by the Hannaford, they've got to use uh, more insight because the only way you're going to tell is when they're dead and injured on the roadway in piles of plastic. And that's my thought on that matter. I hope you do better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trapp. Next. Thanks, Tina Christie, One Metalwood Dive in Scarborough. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for tabling the cell tower discussion and working with us to try to find ways to keep these towers out of residential areas and keep them in industrial zones where they belong. You know. I just want to say, I for one, you know, and I think I'm not the only one, moved to Scarborough from California with the understanding that I was moving into a residential area, not with the expectation that zoning would be changed to include cell towers and decrease my property value and mar the beauty of the area that I bought in. You know, so I really implore you to consider your decisions very carefully and consider the direction you want to take our town in. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Susan Hamill, and I live at 3 Bay Street in Pine Point. Um, I'm here to talk about, uh, just briefly, about the um, skating rink. And um, I just would like to say that I'm very much in favor of the rink. Um, my daughter was on the first girls ice hockey team, and I know a lot about early morning practices. I just wish this had happened 10 years ago. <laughs> but I am very concerned about the process that was used to get this item on the agenda. Um, it seems like there was absolutely no public input. It was a complete surprise to people reading about it in the newspaper. I know to some of the, the members of the council it was a surprise. And it's very concerning to me as a taxpayer in this town that Deals are being made. It looks like deals are being made and business is being discussed behind closed doors that potentially commits taxpayers to big projects coming forward. And um, I know that we have a town council, we have a process, and um, these things need to be more transparent. Um, the land in, ta in Scarborough, the public land, belongs to the taxpayers not to the town manager, not to the town council. And I know deals, land swaps, if you're from Pine Point, you know a lot about land swaps and giveaway of land. And we are very concerned about it. Um, it's possible that this, this project will proceed and the decision will be arrived at um, to go forward with it. And, um, and I hope that will happen. I mean, I, I don't know that this is the right place for it, but uh, I hope a process will be followed where taxpayers can, can learn more about it and counselors can ask a lot of questions. I don't know really how it fits in with the comprehensive plan to have a town center right at Oak Hill that suddenly we're building an ice rink there. But um, I think that we, it's right to table this and have a workshop and um, get some input from from people, you know, from the taxpayers. So um, thank you for, you know, considering tabling it. 
and um, I know that it's, it's important for fundraising purposes to get a memorandum of understanding, but this is not like it has to happen tonight. We need to take our time and we need to think this through. And, um, and like I said, I'm, I'm behind it. I Put me down. Uh, I'm going to make a donation to the capital campaign. I'm very much in favor of it, but I don't like the process <coughs> so far. Anyone else? My name is Robert Rovner, 4 King Street. Um, I have to just reiterate what Sue said because I think, uh, I don't even know where to start with this. I, I really don't. A memo of understanding. I've been here in town for seven years, never heard of one. What's the understanding? Are we understanding that somebody wants to build a, an, ice, an ice rink? I, I'm all in favor of it. I hope they succeed. I hope that they're so overwhelmed that busloads of kids and teams are coming here. But who's going to build the parking lot for the buses? A couple of years from now, who's going to build the parking lot for the teachers? A couple of years from now, who's going to change the infrastructure from Gorham Road to get up to this building? It, if that's all in the letter of understanding, then I'd like to understand and see what's in it. Because just to say you want to support this group and basically have a hot attorney come in and say a memo of understanding is a contract that you're obligated to because you're going to back this is not what this town needs. It seems to me that if you're going to do this, that there was no public hearing. There was no, this is not the forum today to do this. What happened to the zoning board presentation? What happened to the ordinance committee presentation? What happened to the planning board? Then it comes to you. Then you have a second reading. Then we have an opportunity to talk. This didn't happen. <clears throat> when I find out what's going on through an article that Michael Kelly wrote in the leader, and according to one of able to understand, we're being misquoted because the land wasn't being offered by Mr. Hall, but first Mr. Sullivan was presented with this. It's even more alarming because he's the chairman of the committee. I don't know where to go with this stuff, but the process has been circumvented. It's nice that you allowed or recommended to the fellows that represent the Friends of Scarborough Hockey to go to the school board and make their presentation. In a handwritten memo by Superintendent Entwistle, he wrote, school board members Jeff Murray and Chuck Bradish will attend the school board meeting on August 14th in order to be available to answer any questions. No action is required by the school board. This is just to keep the school board and the public informed as it is connected to the schools. Um, this is like getting buried. We don't deserve to have stuff like this buried. This is a five and a half million dollar project. Just give me two more minutes, please. No, you get one minute, sir. <clears throat> a five and a half million dollar project that may very well be funded by a nonprofit organization. It doesn't matter if it's nonprofit or, or if it's profit. We need to know that the town is not going to be responsible for anything, and that that they have enough money behind them to carry this through for what, however many years, and we should not get in an agreement unless we know what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Minutes of July 16, 2014. Oh. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. Are there any adjustments to the agenda?
Yes, um, uh, following the um, council member comments, uh, number order 1477 would be to request an executive session pursuant to uh, Title I of the Maine Revised Statutes 4056C regarding a real estate matter. Okay, thank you. Treasurer's warrants to be signed. I'll do them during the meeting. Order number 1467 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, by adding a, an affordable housing in lieu oh, nice. C to the zoning districts that allow residential density bonuses. And, and the yes, Bacon Town Planner uh, is prepared just to provide a little introduction to this matter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this was before you earlier this summer. It's uh, amendments to some of the town's residential and mixed-use zones that allow for uh, density bonuses. The town already has an allowance for um, increased density if projects actually build affordable housing into um, a development. This is a kind of a twist on that, the, that the Housing Alliance and the Long Range Planning Committee um, came up with last fall and would like to extend to some additional zones, um, and this is instead of um, having to build affordable units within a development, a development project would have the option to uh, pay an in-lieu fee or pay a fee to the town to be used for other affordable housing initiatives within the community, um, such as um, helping with infrastructure costs, infrastructure costs for affordable housing or uh, design costs or, or a revolving loan type um, program. So this is a, a measure that can helpfully um, enable affordable housing to be um, uh, created within the community, such as the Habitat Project or others, um, but in a different way than building the affordable units within a development. Happy to answer questions if you have more uh, detailed ones. Thanks. Hey, do I have a motion? Public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, it's public hearing. Would anyone like to speak on this issue? All right, seeing none, I have a motion. Move of approval. Second. Discussion. <laughs> Jessica. Yeah, so I'll go. Uh, <laughs> um, so I am the liaison for um, the Housing <clears throat> Alliance. So um, I guess just so um, I could explain this a little bit better as well. We already offer um, a variety of in lieu fees. For, for, so there could be um, development transfer fees and, and a few other mechanisms. Um, so the thought process behind this was um, one of the largest hurdles behind affordable housing is the cost of infrastructure and, and, of course, land and, and whatnot. And we found that it's been a fairly good partnership so far um, trying to work when the town has a little bit of resource to add to it. Um, so again, some of these other mechanisms are already in place, and this would just be another kind of tool in the toolbox, if you will, to help you know, create some affordable housing. So. Okay. Councilor Donovan. This this is really intended to make the uh, affordable housing program more flexible. Uh, money, cash, is always a fungible item. It can be used for anything. So uh, you can't always get what you want sometimes with the housing that might be uh, uh, placed at, at a project. It just might not turn out to be uh, as appropriate or suitable as you'd like. But with uh, uh, this added flexible element of paying into the town so the town has the money, can put it together, compile it, and use it uh, in whatever amounts are necessary. So I think it's a really good additional component to our program. Thank you. Councilor Katerina. Um, I, I am personally in favor of this. I think it makes a lot of sense, as, as Councilor Donovan mentioned, to have money which is fungible, um, used in many different ways. Um, the housing stock in Scarborough is really not affordable to the average, so-called average homeowner. So I'm very much in favor of seeing some more efforts made to provide uh, housing for working people. And I think this is a good way to do it because the developers aren't stepping forward 
not because they don't want to, but because of their what it costs to develop to put aside so-called affordable housing. So why don't we take um, lieu, fee, excuse me, fee in lieu of that, and then we can work through the affordable housing uh, folks to do something. So I, I'm very much in favor of this. One more thought that I, I might add. Um, I had one other thought, um, especially for folks that might be listening. Um, there is a dedicated fund that we have in the town that very specifically states what the uses can and cannot be for. Um, so as Dan had talked about, um, there's very specific allowances for how that money can spent, and it all has to be either through um, <coughs> I, know, I think Dan could probably speak a little better to it than I can, but um, it, it has only you know six criteria, I believe, of what you can spend it, and it all revolves around affordable housing. So um, it wouldn't land somewhere else. It, it's its own fund. Right. Just to, uh, if I could further add, beyond the uh, limitations imposed by the council that created this uh, initiative fund you control those monies. So it's not as if staff is free to use those. We'd come back and seek and, and receive your approval case by case. So there'll be a, to the points raised earlier, there'll be public uh, awareness, involvement, transparency, and how those mo funnies, monies are being used going forward. Anyone else? Councilor Benedict. I don't want to be a damper here, however, <clears throat> One thing that I think we need to do, <coughs> excuse me, in conjunction with this, is there is going to be a, some tighter reins on the contractors. Um, I know that we've got at least one that's working on the third project. They were supposed to have built affordable housing in the prior two, and it never got never got built. And we have, I guess us, have, have, have got to take that bull by the horns, and it makes no difference to me if the affordable housing is built first. But we've got to have something that the contractors need to be aware of that this is our money, that we're putting it in for affordable housing, and that that's what, quite personally, what I expect to be built when it's supposed to be built with a project that's got two, three, four, five, twenty-five, I don't care, other houses that they can put on whatever dollar sign they want. That's all i got to say about that. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm in favor of this also uh, going forward. And there are certain aspects that we have to look at as a council. Um, the land in Scarborough is not cheap, and building in Scarborough isn't cheap, and the only way that that's going to be uh, achieved is by trying to do some actions like this. So with that said, um, all those in favor? Okay. Opposed? None. Order number 1470 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Nora Energy Retail, Maine, doing business as Payne Road, Little Mart, number 010024, located at 284 Payne Road, and from Anustat, Lipsertong, doing business as Tai 9 Restaurant, located at 400 Expedition Drive. Okay, would anybody from the public like to speak on this matter, food handler's license? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Motion. Mo right. um, can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Council Holbrook. Just welcome to Scarborough. Right. We were taking bets on who the gas station was going to be. <laughs> I lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Order number 1471 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a liquor license from Enerstadt. I'm sorry, Thank you. <laughs> Doing business as Tai 9 Restaurant located at 400 Expedition Drive. Would anyone from the public like to comment on the liquor license? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Motion. Move approval. 
Second. Anyone like to comment? Do you know comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Under Old Business Order Number 1453 is a second reading on the proposed changes to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, to create a transmission tower overlay district and to update the performance standards there, too. Okay. With this, um, we, have, um, we haven't had the um, workshop, so we have nothing new to present tonight. But if anybody from the public would like to speak on this matter, they may spe step up to the podium. Speak three minutes. And name and address. This is the cell tower? Yes. My name is Rick Mahoney, 34 Tenney Lane. Um, I've sent letters. I think you've all you've all gotten them. And basically, a lot of things that are zoned rural farming really have not been for quite a while. Um, it's my opinion, and a lot of other people in in Tenney Lane, Cold Heart Farm, up and down Pleasant Hill, and other areas that cell towers really ought to be in industrial zones. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Would anyone else like to speak to the cell phone tower issue? Hi, I'm Leslie Gobber. I live at 22 Colthod Farms Road. Um, I'm very happy that the town council is actually tabling this item because the more I look into it, the more concerns I have for the future. One of the things that I really think the town council has to do is protect um, their ability to control what's going to happen in the future on lands. And I think once you change the zoning, you've lost control. I asked someone that work in, works in the cell phone industry some questions about the towers, and I asked them if it was possible to put higher towers in just the industrial zones, would that provide enough coverage for the town? Unfortunately, what they told me is no. The taller towers um, aren't really the solution. They said that each tower only has a certain amount of capacity, so no matter how tall they are, you still need multiple towers to get the kind of coverage that you need. They also told me something that was disturbing, that in general the phone companies do not want to own the towers, that the liabilities involved in owning those towers are enormous, so they actually subcontract the towers. What that said to me is, as a town, what's going to happen when eventually the technology changes, probably to satellite, the companies that own the towers go out of business because their business plan is now lo no longer active. The cell phone companies just sit, switch to satellites, and suddenly as a town, we are left with these enormous, ugly, possibly light, you know, dangerous towers all over the place. I know the council is planning on tabling this, and I, as I said, I'm very happy for that, but I think possibly even just a meeting in September won't be enough to address the multiple concerns that we have as citizens going forward into the future. This technology changes so fast, I don't want the town to get in a position where, first of all, they have lost their control by changing zoning, and then um, that whatever deals are made, the cell phone companies don't have to be responsible for what happens to these towers in the future. So thank you for your thoughtful consideration, and um, hopefully we can come to some win-win um, situation where we can have better coverage, but not at the expense of our citizens today or in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> How are you doing? My name is Jim Brown. I'm from 12 Tenney Lane. I just wanted to come and show my support against the towers. That's basically, I have, I'm still learning all the details about it, but I just wanted to find out how many people were going to be here from the, the area and see what the attendance was. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Okay. Close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Yep. Yes or no? Yes. Any comments? First? Well, I want first. Was there any councilor we get to put the motion on the floor first? Oh, it's it has to be on the floor. Uh, huh? It's non-debatable, though. That's the issue. If right, any. but we we need to open the motion to table. 
Oh, wait. Cody? Does the... No, you can go right to a table motion. You can go right to a table motion. The only concern is if any members okay. of the council have well, comments. Well, here's what I'm going to say first. Like. Does anybody um, on the council want to comment? Make comments to the... Hmm. For the purpose of discussion, I will move right. the item. Yes. So, so I need a second. Okay, so you move second. Second. So you move in the Okay, we'll come back to the table. Then you're make a the motion to right. table. Sounds like okay. in order. Okay. That's okay. proper procedure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Discussion. Um, Councillor Holbrook first. Um, I certainly look forward to the workshop. I think that that's going to be extremely useful for councillors as well as the public. Um, certainly, I, I will <laughs> do not claim to know nearly enough about it. Um, but I do recognize that we do have a fairly significant problem with coverage, and it sounds like, um, that, like I said, with the workshop coming forward, that there's certainly some ideas that we can encompass to make this a little better and have some more control over things. Um, certainly, you can play with setbacks. You can play with, you know, a whole <coughs> multitude of things to, to make folks reasonably happy and still be able to do a few maybe extra towers in town. Um, and the appropriateness of where some of them should be. Um, I know that there was an independent review. I haven't looked at any of that. That's not my committee, so I haven't seen any of that paperwork. But I look forward to being able to dive into it a little better and, and maybe trying to work through it so we can all be reasonably unsatisfied. <laughs> okay, Councillor Donovan. Uh, I, because some of you have showed up and would like to be able to get a sense of where we are, and, and where we're going, I think I'd, I'd like to at least express my view, and I think it's shared by others, but everyone will have an opportunity to uh, express their own point of view. Um, <clears throat> for me, the number one uh, objective is to protect neighborhoods from uh, any adverse impact mm -hmm. that it would have on the value of their property or on the aesthetics uh, of that neighborhood. Uh, uh, I think the health issue is of concern to people. It's not within our jurisdiction that the FCC has the jurisdiction on, on health, but the, the good thing from our point of view is that property values are really a surrogate uh, for, uh, for the health issues. Uh, uh, if you have it in proximity to neighborhoods, people worry about the health concerns. Mm -hmm. if, they ha if it is in proximity to the neighborhood, you worry about values. So. Uh, by uh, having a concern about protecting neighborhoods <clears throat> from any impact on their values or on the aesthetics, you are, in effect, uh, uh, supportive of those who have concerns about the, the health issues. Uh, I think we can have towers in the RF zone uh, uh, if we do it in an intelligent way. For those who attended the Ordinance Committee meeting, it was very instructive uh, I've got to applaud the town planner, Dan Bacon. Uh, he has presented <clears throat> uh, a concept that I think is innovative uh, and very effective. It's a tiered process where it would require uh, uh, several steps be taken before an applicant would ever be able to have their property, uh, 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 have the RF zone house uh, a tower. Uh, and uh, even if it got to that stage, uh, it would n never be allowed on a lot that would be small enough to be in proximity to neighborhoods. So I think we're going in the right direction uh, in terms of developing a program. Uh, I think we need to do some more work. I think the planning, the two representatives from the planning board who spoke at the ordinance committee meeting were both very encouraging in terms of the direction we were heading. And I think that, that was good because up to that point, they weren't very encouraged. So I think we've made some great strides. Uh, I think uh, your input has been very helpful in that regard. I think it opens eyes and gives people a sense of, of what uh, people's concerns are. And so uh, I'm looking forward to the planning board uh, workshop. I think it's going to be uh, the next step towards getting a really effective uh, 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 ordinance uh, that will do both protect neighborhoods and uh, uh, provide coverage that is badly needed in this town where we have many areas of poor coverage. 
Okay. Can I say, can I? Just a minute. Um, did you have something else, Kenarine? No, I was okay. just telling to fix it. Um, okay. Yep. Um, well, thanks, Councillor Donovan. Um, as chair of the ordinance committee, I don't, I'm not quite sure I have that much left to say, except um, I do want to say a couple things. Um, number one, this is something that this group has been working on for over nine months. It's not something that was just thrown piecemeal together. Um, it, 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 it's always hard because the, when, when the process starts happening and then we start getting public, it gets out to the public and then everyone starts hearing about it and then we, it's, it does, it sometimes can feel like we're rushing you and so that's why we're pulling back again. So this isn't going to be just um, thrown at you and I don't want people to feel that way. Um, the other thing I wanted to say too that I'm ho hopeful that will happen with the workshop is that there's a lot of misconceptions out there and there's a lot of data on this. You would, it was amazing to me um, how much data there is and how much conflicting data there, there, there can be. So I'm hopeful that by the time we get to um, the workshop, we'll be able to have gone through some of that. I also want to say, too, that um, the town doesn't enter in, into anything without um, making sure that we have everything in order. So we would never enter into a contract with um, a cell phone tower or, or a cell, cell provider without making sure that we have everything done the right way. Um, that includes removal of towers when they're done being used. Um, that includes um, how far away they need to be. I mean, so many. there are so many pieces to this. It's it's actually quite incredible. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, please, I do encourage you to continue to keep emailing us your thoughts and suggestions. They're always very helpful. Um, I've been enlightened to a few things actually over the last couple weeks with this. Um, and if you can, if you feel strongly about this, attend the workshop um, because you will get hopefully a lot of answers there. Thank you. Council of Benedict. Do you know nothing? Okay, Council Holbrook. I forgot something. <laughs> okay. um, I, I did just want to say that I had um, misspoke perhaps a little bit under Councilor comments a, a week or two back, or a couple weeks back now. Um, I had meant to say that over, I was talking about Scotto Hill and the tower up there, and it's not you know, by osmosis that you don't notice that it's there anymore. Um, I had meant that o over time the trees have matured and tall, mature trees have reached almost the height of the tower, and that's something to maybe think about when we're talking about um, the site locations and the type of plantings we're putting there, um, because over time, you know, different species grow and they meet that tree line and it blends out, I, I guess was what I did not word properly the last time. <laughs> so. Um, it's not that it's not there, but it, it, it helps me, you know, the, the view a little bit. So, um, but again, one of those small tweaks maybe we can play with um, to address. So, that's it. Okay. Council of St. Clair. I'm good, thank you. Oh, do you want my motion? I'm sorry, I thought Jim, <laughs> Jim, you're all set. You yes, want sure. Everyone's all set. Um, I'd like to put a motion out um, on the table to motion this to the... Um, uh, September 17th meeting, I believe, is the next one, yes. um, because that will fall after our roundtable discussion. Okay. So that's my motion. Second. Okay, I have a second. Jim. A second. Jim. Non-debatable. Okay, it's non-debatable. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Under new business order number 1472 is the first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the proposed designation of Griffin Road Affordable Housing Development District and adopting the development program for such district and authorizing uh, an 
and authoring a credit enhancement agreement for such district pursuant to the attached order number 1472 and the provisions of Chapter 207 of Title 30A of the Maine Revised Statutes as amended and authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents pursuant to said district. Mr. Chan, if I could just uh, yeah. offer a couple of words uh, to begin. I see Mr. Rosbera has taken the podium. Um, tonight, this is first reading, as, as the clerk just characterized. And tonight, this evening, we have one of the partners with the Griffin Road Housing Limited Partnership, Rocky Rosbera. Um, the other partner is Kevin Bunker, individually, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Kevin is really, uh, not to take anything away from Rocky, but is the, the one we've been working with most directly on the TIF itself. Uh, we did provide members of council a copy of a PowerPoint, which was uh, essentially the material that was uh, covered in the workshop. We're certainly pleased to have Kevin uh, present that uh, PowerPoint to the council and to the public at your next meeting, if that serves your needs. But I know Rocky's here to talk about uh, the project and generally about what the TIF and how that relates. Beyond that, we do have Shauna Cook Mueller from Bernstein Shore representing the town's interests. And I've asked her to be prepared as may be needed to kind of uh, talk us through the mechanics of this process. Okay. Good evening. Uh, I'm Rocky Rosbera. Uh, I just want to give you folks a, a quick update of where we are with our project and what our project is. I think most of you are pretty familiar with it. But basically what we have is a 36 unit uh, one bedroom apartments um, that we're proposing to build uh, on Griffin Road and I've put the put the board up here so the council can see where it is. Um, I think you, most of you folks might remember that this was before the council originally. Uh, we got a zone change and went through um, several uh, changes through the project and different proposals and we finally uh, in working with the neighbors came to this uh, proposal of uh, 36 one bedroom apartment units uh, that would be age restricted as well as income restricted. Um, and so we've actually been to, through the process with the town, been to the planning board, got approval for the project at the uh, July 14th meeting. Um, I think we actually met with you folks in a workshop uh, a day or two later and discussed uh, the possibility of a TIF uh, to help move this project forward. And uh, so the way this project works is that our financing would, would come through uh, the state of Maine. Um, and in order to get that financing, we need to go through a competitive uh, process um, where they evaluate projects that are presented to them. Um, we'll be making that, pres that presentation to the, to the state in early October. And uh, what they do is they go through a process where they award points for different uh, features of the project. And one of the ways that we could gain additional points is if we had a TIF from the town uh, to, to present with that. So um, we're here tonight to, to talk to you about that as, as we did at the workshop meeting. Um, the financing um, process, once we go through that process, what, hap what has to happen is our project has to be high enough, score enough points to get the financing. And uh, once we get there, the project would then move forward. So with the town support, with the TIF, it would help us move this project forward and actually get it built. Um, I think that's about all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Sean is here to, to talk about the TIF itself. Um, happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, would you like to speak as to the TIF? Very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Shauna Mueller. As um, the town manager said, I am an attorney at Bernstein Sure. I'm here on behalf of the town of Scarborough and have worked for the town on tax increment financing for many years. And I just thought it might be useful to take a little step back and talk about what a TIF is and what specifically an affordable housing TIF is. TIF is short for tax increment financing. And um, tax increment financing is something is an economic development program that's authorized by state statute. Municipalities can establish districts in your community, and I like to think of it as you put your arms around an area in your town and you freeze the assessed value of that area for some term of years. For that term of years, the term of the TIF district, any increased assessed value that's added to that district from that starting point is called captured value, and property taxes that are paid on that increased assessed value 
they go into a separate fund, not the general fund, but into a TIF development program fund and can only be used for specific purposes. Um, the town has a number of TIF districts for economic development. Um, I don't believe the town has ever put in place an affordable housing TIF district. Is that we right? Have. We have. That's the, uh, that's the mm -hmm. Commons question. Ah, okay, okay, great. So there are two different TIF statutes at the state level. One is much more commonly used for economic development projects generally, and the affordable housing TIF statute, which is less common, I think, just because there are fewer affordable housing developments in the state. Um, and as uh, Mr. Rosbera said, it has become more prevalent for affordable housing projects that are being proposed through this uh, competitive process at Maine Housing. Um, to ask for municipal support through an affordable housing TIF because that program is so competitive. Um, there are a lot of projects that are competing for those, that, that main housing financing each year. And um, so that's become statewide um, more active an area of TIFs. Uh, so the, the TIF revenue, the taxes that are paid on that increased assessed value go into that development program fund and they can be used by the municipality for your own affordable housing type projects um, or programs and then you can also reimburse the a project itself some of those revenues that they've paid, tax revenues they've paid, as an incentive for them to undertake the project. Um, affordable housing projects are a little bit different than some other uh, economic development TIFs because um, so much of the operating costs and the development costs that go into uh, affordable housing projects are combed through and our public documentation as all of that, those materials have to be submitted to Maine Housing in the competitive process. So the town um, and Maine Housing have the opportunity to really see a lot of detail about these projects that are already <coughs> public. Um, so I, I just thought some of that background might be helpful. The only other piece I wanted to touch on, which is just a helpful reminder, is a feature of TIFs is an economic a financial incentive that a municipality has to go into a TIF, which is the tax shift benefit concept. And that idea is that every, every town in the state has what's called the state valuation, the total amount of value in your town. And as your town grows, you get a higher state valuation. Um, that number, that state valuation, is a factor in a bunch of formulas. The formula that calculates your state education subsidy, the formula that calculates your municipal revenue sharing subsidy, the formula that calculates your county taxes that you owe. And the idea here is that as you have more value in your community, you have a better ability to pay for things on your own. So you don't need as much subsidy and you can afford to pay more county tax. For value that's captured in a TIF district, that is actually invisible to your state valuation number for the term of the TIF district. <coughs> so what that means is that you don't experience that impact, that negative impact of having new value in your community for the value that's inside of a TIF district. So I just thought I would give that refresher to you all and the public as you consider this application. Um, moving to this application, just to set up the process and explain a little bit about the materials that were in your packet. The affordable housing TIF statute requires that um, we, the town, submit an application if the council approves this to Maine Housing for the designation of the TIF districts. And there is an application form that you'll see, and mostly the developer has completed that application because there's a lot of information about the project, and I reviewed it. Um, but you'll see in there a lot of information about the types of units, the financing, the schedule of development that's planned. Um, that's what's called the development program document or the TIF application. Um, then there is a different document that's called the Credit Enhancement Agreement. That would be the contract that would be executed by the town and the developer whereby the town is agreeing to reimburse a certain percentage of property taxes to the developer for a term of years. Um, and I have drafted that and that's in your packets. 
um, that's being reviewed currently by the developer's attorney, so we may see some changes to that, but, um, but that document is, is actually the contract between the two parties. Um, I, I'm not sure if it was stated before, but the proposal from the developer is for them to receive 15 years of property tax reimbursements that equate to 50% of their new property taxes. Um, you'll see in the document it talks about a 17-year long TIF, um, but we build in a couple of extra years just to make sure that if the project doesn't get built next year, um, the TIF district will last at least 15 years. But through the contract terms, they will get a reimbursement for only a period of 15 total years within that 17-year term. I guess the other part of that, uh, the developer's request was for 50% of that future value. Um, council may recall uh, there's, there's a decision to be made. In fact, this has been drafted to actually, actually capture 100%. And so the other 50% uh, is, is proposed to be directed toward this affordable housing initiative fund. Uh, and we spoke of that earlier. Uh, that was, that's a decision entirely um, for the town to make and I've drafted it in that way and recommend that you consider a full 100% TIF. I guess the other point I'd make, I've become uh, to appreciate that this TIF is essential for this project. Um, it's, not, it's not like an economic development TIF where the developer uh, holds us hostage. If we truly want, think this is a good, valuable project for this town, because it's so reliant, entirely reliant on federal tax credits and the application process through Maine Housing, the three points that are afforded are far more important than the money. Um, the simple truth is, without this TIF, this project doesn't go as currently configured anyway. Uh, so it, it's a kind of a it's it's an interesting and different uh, dynamic uh, with respect to this proposal. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there any member of the public that would like to speak to this issue? Anyone? Okay. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Discussion? Questions? I had just one other point um, I wanted to make for, um, for the folks that might be listening as well. Uh, there is a clause in this that if this project does not move forward, this particular senior housing rent control project does not move forward, there is no TIF. The TIF goes away, it disperses, and it's just regular building with regular tax and, and regular everything. So, excellent point. Yep. Okay, Councilor Katerina. Uh, I just have a quick question. It's for clarification, not so, so much for myself, but again for people who may be listening. Is someone I'm not sure who, and it could be you, <laughs> Shona. Is um, how this TIF allows the developer to offer below market rates on the rent, the relationship between that, if there is one. To, a to offer... Below market rates. Below market In other words, rates, it's so-called right. affordable. Well, I mean, it, that may be a question better left for the developer to answer, but I can do my best, which is um, the TIF revenues that are reimbursed are the developers asking that this TIF be devoted, those revenues be devoted to operating costs, to support operating costs. Um, the reason that the federal tax credits and municipal TIFs are required for these kinds of projects is because there's low rent, there's low operating cost revenue in the future that's anticipated for this kind of project. So it's very hard to attract any kind of commercial developer without tax credits or tax increment financing. So that's the, that's the dynamic at play here. I don't know if that gets to your question. Yeah, yeah okay. I mean... So in other words, by offering this to the developer, the developer, because operating costs are so high, it allows also the developer to not have to ask as much in rent as they normally would in order to cover their operating costs? That's right. Okay. That's right. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? No. No. Okay, this is the first reading. All those in favor? No opposed. Thank you. 
Order number 1473 is act on the request to approve the dispatch agreement between the town of Old Orchard Beach and the town of Scarborough and authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents relating to this agreement. Mr. Uh, I don't know exactly when, but probably six or eight months ago, uh, the public safety officials, the fire chief and police chief were approached by their colleagues in Old Orchard um, inquiring the, our interest and ability to perhaps provide PSAP and dispatch services for the town of Old Orchard. Um, I believe there's been past relationships. Uh, we certainly have very, very close mutual aid relationships with Old Orchard, so there's great uh, relationship and affinity um, and uh, has always been there. Uh, and Old Orchard for three years now, or almost three, have been with the town of Sanford, and for reasons that I don't quite know, uh, we're interested in looking at something closer to home. And so um, I, was, I encouraged uh, the chiefs to speak to their colleagues, and one, my one proviso is that it certainly can't cost Scarborough taxpayers anything. And kind of with that basic caveat, uh, they work diligently with their colleagues and have um, got to the point of having uh, developed a, a transition plan and a contract that, uh, through an interlocal agreement which would uh, in fact have Scarborough provide all PSAP and that's an acronym standing for public, help me out, um, public safety answering point. So that's uh, taking the initial call and then all the dispatch services. Those are two distinct services and we would provide both of them. Uh, the Old Orchard Beach Town Council passed this same interlocal agreement that's on your agenda tonight on August 5th. And certainly all of the cost factors were talked about and are considered and were approved uh, as part of the fiscal year 2015 budget. So we've anticipated this. Um, that's about the extent of my knowledge. Uh, I, I see Chief Moulton and Chief Thurl on the back and certainly they're capable to provide uh, um, great in-depth uh, technical understanding should you want that. Is that of any interest? Yeah, I have, can I speak or? Yeah, did yeah. you have interest in asking a question? No, I didn't need to ask them a question. I just wanted to make a statement. Was all. Oh, we just get a motion. Okay. Um, and then come right back. I got to do public comment first. Yep. Anyone from the uh, public like to speak on this matter? Dispatch agreement between Scarborough and Old Orchard Beach. All right, seeing none, I close the public hearing. Uh, do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Okay. Council St. Clair. I just wanted to say that um, this wholeheartedly has my endorsement. Um, I think uh, even more so for the town of Old Orchard, which is a town that I used to work in. Um, it's safer and better for them to be serviced by a town that's closer to them. Um, and it's better for them to be serviced by the best of the best. And I, I think that's us. So um, I went through the um, contract pretty closely uh, and, and I didn't see any anything that would concern me. Um, and I'm just, I think it's going to be a great partnership. I also think it's not a bad thing for us to have a little bit of revenue coming in um, above what it is going to cost us to do it. So I think that's a, it's a great thing. Go on. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'll be supporting this this evening. I think the first thing is always um, that there is no cost to the town. That's that's always a, a plus. Um, I think I'd have to think twice if it cost us something. But um, the other thing that I do like about this, um, and I don't know if some of you may or may not remember, but there was a point in time while I've been here that um, we were concerned that we might lose our ability to have a dispatch because mm. the powers that be have decided we need to consolidate and, and those sorts of things um, and have less of these centers. So the more that we do as a community, I think, is going to help us to preserve that designation of, of being a dispatch center. And um, I think it's always better when your dispatch is local. Um, there are so many problems that arise out of having a dispatch center that's 100 miles away and the people just don't know the area, they don't know the house, it's a confused caller. You know, so again, anything we can do to bolster our status as, as being a viable center for dispatch, I, I think is in our best interest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Council Benedict. <coughs> Excuse me. I spoke with the uh, dispatch over here in the police department because I wanted to get their take on what this was because a couple of years ago it was not getting the recommendations over there and totally flipped around and enforced to me that everything in that agreement, and I mean everything, has passed, been passed through the dispatches. They're 110% on board with it. They have got absolutely no problem with it. And I spoke with more than one. And I was absolutely <laughs> a little shocked after what happened two years ago. But uh, I'll be voting for this as the dispatches are tickle pink with what's going on. Hey, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Well, I, I also wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a good opportunity to work together with another town um, as far as cost savings. Uh, I think that eventually you'll see a savings. Um, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, with that, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order okay. number 1474 is acted on the request to accept the following street pursuant to Title 23 of the Main Revised Statute, subsection 3025, and the requirements of Section 4 of the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance. Fairway Drive located in the Pleasant Hillwood subdivision. Tom. Yes. Uh, last. Uh, September, September 18th, 2013, uh, this council, <coughs> maybe not this council, most of this council uh, approved a memorandum of understanding with the Pleasant Hill Woods uh, Homeowners Association regarding the upgrade and ultimately the acceptance of Fairway Drive, which is the single street that services this uh, the subdivision. I believe there's 16 different lots. Uh, just for reference purposes, Fairway Drive is right off Highland Avenue, uh, fairly close to Pleasant Hill School. Um, it has been the town's uh, policy to work with homeowners groups and private uh, way owners, if you will, uh, to upgrade their facilities and ultimately for those roads to become uh, town roads. And this has been a, a very good cooperative relationship. I'm pleased to report that the homeowners group has fulfilled all of their obligations uh, and has made payment, which we are in receipt of. Um, and so we're here for the final piece, which is the, for the town to officially accept Fairway Drive as a public road. And uh, with that, I would then record those uh, quick lane deeds with the registry, and uh, we'll, we'll proceed uh, as such. So it, it's been a, a very good process with this group, and I'm pleased to recommend that you do consider accepting this road. Okay. Thank you. With that, um, any members of the public, would they like to speak to this order? Anyone? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. I have a motion. Motion to accept. Discussion? No discussion. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1475 is act to authorize the town manager to accept a donation from the Portland Water District for a parcel of property located at 6 Gorham Road, map U43, lot 008, and to sign an easement deed between the town of Scarborough and the Portland Water District. Yes, um, perhaps a year ago, uh, the town was approached by Portland Water District uh, regarding their interest, the real need to construct a new water main, essentially from uh, 114 Agorham Road to Sawyer Road. Uh, there's actually some, some great interest on the part of the town for fire service. Uh, the, uh, the systems that are in place are, are quite old. Pressure is not what we'd like for public safety and water um, f fire purposes. So we very much uh, support from a public safety point of view the upgrade of this line. Uh, rather than disrupting uh, Route 1, they're interested in having it uh, traverse through the campus back here. Uh, they have proposed a, an approximate alignment of this easement, um, although they've agreed in the language to uh, work with us, uh, depending on what we do on campus, to kind of uh, work around our interest in developing uh, some parts of the uh, vacant land. As part of those conversations, uh, the water company also owns 
the former water tank site. It's uh, approximately a half acre site. Uh, it's, it's currently fenced in adjacent to the high school and behind Jones and Warren, if you can picture that. Uh, again, that's uh, historically hosted a water tower that was torn down sometime in the mid-2000s. I don't know exactly when. Just an interesting historical footnote. Uh, the property was acquired by the water company in 1925 from none other than Benjamin Wentworth, uh, so uh, the original farm. Uh, and they have obviously no longer any interest or use for that property and have offered that uh, to the town. So uh, what is contemplated in this action is uh, an even exchange uh, of granting an easement for them to install a, a water main in exchange for the town taking ownership of that water tower site. Okay, good. Would any uh, members of the public like to speak to this order? Anyone? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Move to Do it. Second. Discussion? <coughs> Councilor Holbrook? <laughs> um, I, I just, I guess the only thing I would have to say is I, I think it's worth it in the in the grand scheme of things we get a half acre we get water lines that are more appropriate down to Sawyer Road we get better hydrants I, I think that's a, a fairly win-win for us as a town and a community so I plan on supporting it okay anyone else Councilor Benedict uh, I just said I had a question as to how big in terms of either square feet linear feet, whatever, that the easement would be, uh, the actual easement. It's proposed at 40 feet in width, and uh, the, their initial proposal kind of is gerrymandered through the lot. It recognizes existing features, but beyond that, they're willing to work with us. I, I don't believe we'll see this um, within the next uh, five to seven years. That's kind of their horizon. Uh, it's on their capital plan, if you will. Uh, the, there are things that the town is considering that may happen in this vicinity, and to the extent that we can uh, better articulate what our needs will be, they'll deviate around, they'll work around that. So um, I believe this is going to be a force main, so you don't have the issues of straight line or gravity and those sorts of things. Uh, they can move it around objects. Um, so I, uh, that, that's, it's 40 feet in width, I can tell you for certain. The route, the actual route will probably change over time. Okay, that's fine. Hey, Councilor Donovan. Uh, just a question to the town manager. Is the la uh, um, assuming that the layout is being done in a manner to minimize the any adverse impact on our town's property interests over which this easement is going to rest? Certainly, the easement simply allows them to, uh, to install a line and to be able to. Um, and maintain that line, uh, they must uh -huh. restore back to original condition all lands they disturb. So there's an incentive on their part to, to work around certainly structures, obviously, uh, but even parking areas. Uh, it's much cheaper and easier to restore an open field as uh, than it is a parking lot for, for that matter. So uh, that's the... And really the question is, uh, are, are we getting more than we're giving? That's really the... the the, the question is that we're the, the well, easement is being laid out in a manner that it's not going to have any material adverse effect on our ability to use or develop the property that we already own. I believe there are, uh, well, and, and I say this based on my understanding over, you know, for, of the capital needs and expectations <laughs> for this town over the foreseeable future. I think there's a reasonable way for them to um, install their line without impacting any of our use, intended use of this property. If you simply look at square footage, uh, you know, 21,000 square feet as compared to something over 100,000 square feet, it's not fair, but the difference is an easement is not ownership, and we're acquiring this fee, fee simple interest uh, in, in the half acre lot. Um, and we are involved in a negotiation with them as to where the actual easement will end up being situated? I asked them to indicate what the, the likely location is, what they've done, uh, but they did add language, and I can read it to you if you like. Um, 
The district further agrees to relocate this easement and any pipelines located therein to mutually agreed upon location in the future if required by the town for future development of the town property. Uh, that was really just uh, to recognize that uh, things may change over time. Mm -hmm. they, they have not committed to a time frame that they'll build their system. Um, they're a quasi-public entity or they are a public entity. I, I have to have trust and faith that they will um, honor this. It's part of the easement deed language and we'll remind them of that. No, that, that I think that's very important language. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? Council Benedict. Uh, just a quick FYI. Um, they, in fact, can take pipe and go under asphalt. And that's been something in the last short few years that they've got machinery and whatnot that they can go, I don't know how many feet down. Run away. Oh. Yeah, they can direct, directional no. bore is the technology. Right. Yeah. But they can, they can do it, so oh. it Interesting. is available. Okay, anyone else? Okay, with that, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Thank you all. Order number 1476 is act to authorize the town manager to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Friends of Scarborough Hockey. Yeah. Do you want to start? Yeah, if I could. Um, there's been a lot of discussion. I think there's been some speculation as to how this comes forward and whether process has been followed or circumvented. Um, I'll just speak from my involvement, and I think I've probably been involved the longest and since since the beginning, I was first introduced to this proposal or this idea back uh, just about a year ago, uh, July of, of last year, and worked through a series of meetings with uh, Friends of Scarborough Hockey uh, with their concept. And, and I must say, I was always, uh, from the first meeting and even till tonight, I'm, I'm very interested in the concept uh, and want to be supportive. Um, and so myself and Bruce Gulliver, the Community Services Director, provided some input. Um, provided our thoughts, and they were only our thoughts. Um, and as things progressed, a number of councillors kind of came into that conversation. Chairman Sullivan was part of some of those. I think perhaps uh, Councillor Holbrook was part of a meeting. Uh, and all of that was intended to try to widen the audience and get further and other perspectives. Um, there really isn't a, an existing committee of council that this could be referred to, uh, just in terms of our committee structure. and so. Sometime late spring, early summer, uh, we were kind of at a at a stand, standstill, if you will, as to how do we advance this to see the light of day and to begin a, a more open and, and public process. And so I suggested uh, a memo a memorandum of understanding is a is a decent vehicle to kind of start to, to flush out the skeleton of a of a concept. And that's what this uh, is at least the first attempt to do to. Um, um, it's not a binding legal document, and it's not intended to be, uh, but it's intended to advance the conversation, and here we are tonight. So the timeline, the initiative, is entirely driven by the Friends of Scarborough Hockey. This is not something that we've thought of, that we are, are driving whatsoever, though I, I am intrigued. I think it has some uh, great interesting potential. Um, some details need to be sorted through yet. So that's quickly uh, kind of how we got to where we are tonight and uh, I'm pleased that we're kind of widening the conversation and I'm very interested to support the council as we move forward. Okay, um, <clears throat> friends of uh, Scarborough Hockey here tonight and Jeff and did like to make a short presentation uh, to the council with a little more information. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Murray. I live here in Scarborough on uh, 25 Coulthard Farms Road. Uh, Chuck Bradish is here with me this evening as well, also a resident of Scarborough. And I uh, thought it might be useful for the council to understand a little bit of the history of where of what got us here tonight to speak to you. And uh, it goes back uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, May of uh, 2013, when uh, old Chuck is the president of the boys' hockey boosters here in town. I'm the president of the girls' hockey boosters. And we had a meeting with the athletic director in which he informed us that there was going to be very little ice available for the ice hockey teams here in town to practice on uh, during the 2013-14 season. Uh, there's a lot of reasons behind all of that, and I'd be happy to explain them another time if you'd like. 
but uh, the end result of that was that we uh, started a conversation around whether uh, that lack of ice time that was available for the school here in Scarborough could possibly lend its way into uh, the development of an ice arena here in Scarborough. And so uh, we started a process with, uh, with some discussions in the community, um, but it was really based on some history that we have. So both of us have been very engaged in youth hockey here in the area for many, many years. I ran the program out at uh, Gorm uh, called uh, Huskies Youth Hockey at the time, and uh, Chuck was an active member on the board of directors there as well. And uh, so we were very aware of the problems associated with the ice availability in the area. There's simply more skaters than there is ice time available. Um, young kids oftentimes very early on, uh, on the ice during the days. Um, and so we saw some other issues as well, right? Scarborough has never really had a home ice that they could, uh, you know, call their own, put a banner up, things of that nature, and certainly has moved ice arena to ice arena over time. And, of course, with our work in the youth programs, we've seen a lot of growth in this sport uh, at all uh, ages, as well as uh, with both genders. So the growth of the girls game in the state of Maine has certainly increased, and we've seen a lot more in the way of middle school hockey in addition to uh, that at the high school level. So. Uh, so that was some of the background that got us started on this process. Ultimately, we started doing a little bit of research to determine whether this process would be viable. Uh, we reached out to some of the school administration. We spoke to the superintendent, the principal, the athletic director, got their input as to what their thoughts were along these lines. We spoke to some local uh, rink operators and talked to them about the time that they have available for programs, whether it was from Scarborough or other towns in the area. Uh, we spoke to a few different uh, developers of ice arenas, uh, the folks up in Falmouth, it's called Family Ice Center, um, but uh, more recently the Ice Vault up in uh, Augusta and the Norway Savings Bank Arena up in, in uh, Auburn. Uh, we spoke to all those people and, and then we uh, further uh, reached out to some of the surrounding towns. Scarborough was not the only town that was affected by ice availability last year. Uh, Cape Elizabeth, South Portland were both in the same boat as us. Um, and so we spoke to them and, and got some initial impressions as to whether they might be interested in participating in a rink should one be available here in the town of Scarborough. So with all that background uh, from, from the past as well as with some of that research done, we determined that it was in, in fact a viable process. And so at that time we developed this uh, organization called the Friends of Scarborough Hockey and, um, and started to create a business plan that would try to support an ice arena here in town. And we based that uh, business plan really on, on three uh, primary issues. One is that ice availability. And I'd point out to you that last year uh, for the Scarborough uh, varsity boys, varsity girls, and junior varsity boys, uh, there were 68 uh, times that those uh, players had to go to a 5.30 a.m. practice uh, down in either Saco or down in Biddeford at the uh, University of New England. and. Um, uh, we ran into some issues associated with that as well, not only just the time, so the ice availability was one of the issues, but there was a, a cost associated with the proximity of that, those ice arenas. And so as booster organizations and, and through some funding through the school budget and so forth, um, there's a lot of costs associated with the busing of the players. So, you know, if you're a hockey player, if you're a soccer or football player, you come here to the high school and you practice right on the turf. Well, the hockey players don't have that opportunity. They need to get to a practice somewhere. And so somewhere the order of $30,000 was spent last year on busing alone to get players to practices and home games, never mind what they might do to get to, uh, to some of the away games. And then ultimately the third piece was the, was the component which is about that ownership. So as I mentioned, we do have a turf here, we have a gymnasium, uh, home courts, home fields uh, for many of our teams in town. And, um, and it would be very nice, we think, that uh, we would have the same opportunity at the, at the high school level for ice hockey if we were to have, have a home ice, a uh, place where we could call our own, and in fact support things like locker rooms that would support the, uh, the players instead of having them always bringing their gear to and from the arena. So those were kind of the three issues that drove us to, uh, it, within the business plan itself, uh, we defined a few specific goals associated with the, um, with the business plan. One was to create a, just a single sheet of ice uh, for uh, the use for school age kids and uh, the community itself. Um, we wanted to make sure that this rink would uh, operate uh, profitably, and so we looked at it as a seasonally run rink, one that will not be operated in the summer. There's a lot of issues associated with filling summertime ice. Uh, we would run this as a uh, nonprofit, and uh, in fact, we have headed down that path with this program. 
and uh, ultimately make sure that this was a privately funded enterprise. So we weren't looking to the town um, to support us through any funding, but rather to uh, businesses and individuals locally, uh, maybe some other grant processes that would allow us to build this without any taxpayer funding. So uh, part of that business plan finally was uh, that the uh, cost of the whole process would be about five and a half million dollars. And that included uh, the design of the uh, building itself as well as acquisition of land and the construction of the building, the equipment associated with it, Zambonis, things of that nature, and the first year's operating costs. Uh, getting projects like this started had some costs associated with them. We didn't want to assume what we could do in the first year of operations, so we included that in the original budgeted uh, $5.5 million. So with uh, a business plan put together, uh, we kind of started thinking about what that implementation process was. And um, as uh, Mr. Hall suggested, we ended up with some discussions with a variety of different people. Um, but one of the first things that we did is we filed for nonprofit status for our organization. And uh, we started looking into opportunities for land here in town, um, some private, some public. Um, but there's a variety of different discussions with a number of different stakeholders in the community, uh, the town manager, the head of community services, uh, the school administration, uh, different landowners, potential donors in the town, as well as uh, others uh, like us who would support the idea of putting uh, a hockey rink in, and I would point out also members of the figure skating community. Uh, ultimately, that led to us developing some initial plans uh, for the arena, and, uh, and I would point out that uh, through this whole process, we eventually it was suggested to us that maybe there was an opportunity to use some town land as a location for the ice arena. And so uh, that, I have to say, was uh, a kind of a step back for us. It was never something that we had considered at the beginning of this process. Um, but after some consideration, we thought maybe that was, in fact, one of the best opportunities. Certainly, uh, having it on town land um, gives both uh, the, uh, the students a lot of opportunities. <coughs> one of them would be simply getting out of school and potentially walking across a parking lot or uh, just walking close by to go to uh, an ice hockey practice like they might do with other sports that they play here in town. Um, but the uh, um when we were thinking about this from the perspective of the public land, right, we have always looked at this as a private enterprise, granted a, a not-for-profit enterprise, but uh, as a private entity. And um, so when that process came through, we're thinking about public land, we're thinking about a private enterprise. And again, talking with Mr. Hall, we suggested that maybe this memorandum of understanding would get us to a point that we could uh, speak with the town about how that might work. And, uh, and ensure that, uh, as I mentioned before, we weren't uh, looking into taxpayer funding and so forth for this, but at the same time putting in a place which would be most beneficial for the town. So uh, I guess I'd end tonight with a few uh, thoughts for you uh, associated with what we identify at least as some of the key benefits of, uh, of the rink itself. Um, the first, of course, is, is what drove us here, and that is the improved student access. Um, simply having our students get up and, and head for ice hockey practice as early as they did over the last couple of years um, just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And, um, and in talking with the surrounding communities, again, Cape Elizabeth and South Portland very specifically, we know they have the same issues and we know they have interest very specifically in working with us um, to fulfill, to fill, I should say, um, the ice usage here at this uh, the rink that we're proposing. Obviously, there's some discussion around community access, anything like this with um, a, a not-for-profit, I think, should be giving back to the community. We would want to do so as well. Uh, we think of things like Winterfest and, and other programs like that, which oftentimes have trouble associated with weather and the like. Um, uh, a rink like this could help us in those sorts of endeavors. There's certainly the, the part about reduced transportation costs. As I mentioned, there's a lot of money spent on busing last year. That's not a new thing. It has been going on for quite a number of years. And, uh, and so this would be, from an economic side of things, uh, a benefit to the town. Um, ultimately, we think that there's a lot of economic opportunity around this rink as well. Um, I've been going to hockey rinks for a long time, and, uh, and I stop on my way in and out of those hockey rinks for food, drink, coffee, uh, you know, the hardware store that's close by it, all those sorts of things. And um, there's no mistake about that. That happens with all the uh, hockey parents that I know, and I'm sure would be the same case here if this rink were uh, in the center of Scarborough. Uh, but a, a few things that I think are very important and obviously that will be part of the discussion, I think, going forward. Um, one is that we're, we're very serious about the premise of, of no taxpayer burden here. Um, this has always been intended to be privately funded, so, um, so we have no expectations of the taxpayers paying for this rink. 
Um, the second thing is with some discussion around the possible site in here on, on town grounds, we look at that as the opportunity for us to help build out the town campus, again, without uh, the taxpayer impact. And finally, uh, just the concept of, of extending the town's infrastructure through some private funding. It's a little different, I'm sure, than, than we've heard in the past here in, in Scarborough, um, but we feel very confident in the plan that we have and the ability to bring this rink to, to fruition, um, and hopefully that that uh, helps build our, our community a little bit more. So um, I thank you very much for the time tonight, and uh, we certainly look forward to, uh, to discussing this project further with the Council in, uh, in coming times. Okay. Thank you. All right, now uh, we'll go to uh, public comments. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak? Is that, have you dispensed with that? Was that actually tabled? It hasn't been Was tabled yet. It hasn't been tabled. Martin Tripp, 26 Oceanwood. A year? The people have been talking about this for a year, and this is where it comes to you get a memorandum of understanding, and nobody's heard about it for a year? I don't know. I only heard about it just before the Board of Education meeting. So I went to the Board of Education meeting to gain more information on this. The Board of Education, they ask a few lame questions, and then they say they're on board with it. I got a couple of questions. Like the man just says it's a business plan. Uh, why should this be built on town property? I don't understand that. Does this imply a town commitment? Obviously. Why is it on a school property again? Second time. Why should we have two other towns with an input on this with other boards to show and use our town property? Now you're going to have two more towns in it. Is there a plan of removal? This doesn't work. Who gets stuck with it? Does a town get stuck with it because we have an implied interest in this? Does a taxpayer get stuck with it? Is there an insurance bond for 20 years worth of uh, operation? Do they guarantee me 20 years worth of operation? We'll put it someplace else. Why shouldn't the other towns get it? Why is it put in one of the most congested areas in the town? This idea of a campus and a large interest in this Oak Hill region, I think this is a bad idea. What about the teacher parking? I just went over and looked at it. There's a hundred spaces that would be taken from teacher parking. Do they get moved out into the woods? Do the kids get moved out into the woods? Do the kids who pay $50 per season or whatever to park there, do they have the privilege of walking an extra hundred yards because we're putting this project in there? I think you could consult the kids on this one. A 630-seat arena. Nobody says Wait a minute, if they fill that up and they have to go in and out and they have multiple tournaments and games, what does that impact the traffic pattern that's established in this town? We've got enough traffic in the Oak Hill intersection that this should be a concern for everybody. Who carries insurance? Somebody goes to that game and it's on school <coughs> property is the school responsible for the insurance to reach this arena? If somebody's going only for private use and they have an accident on the school property by slipping or sliding since it's the winter, is it a school liability and a town liability? This is a question I'd like to know. And you know, gentleman just says it costs $30,000 for busing. Did I miss it? I, I, maybe I missed it. Right now we pay $30,000 for busing. Is that inclusive? Is that part of the bill? Is there, are there coaches? Is their expense part of that $30,000 or is it just $30,000 for busing? How many kids are in this program that just spend $30,000 for busing? Even $30,000 for the whole program. That would just come up to me. It says, 30, are there 100 kids? That's $300 a kid? Do they supplement it or pay for it? I got a lot of questions, and before you go and approve this or look at it, and I stopped here because I only got three minutes and my bell's gone off. Hmm. And <laughs> I, knew, I knew that's about what I could get, but before you act on this thing, these are legitimate questions, and they're not all answered consistently and properly. 
I don't think this is a good idea at all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I close the public hearing. Okay, is does the council wish to discuss or I do. Yes, I do. Okay, I need a motion. <clears throat> Uh, for, the for, the, for the purpose of discussion, I'll um, we'll move the Second. Okay. Discussion. Council of St. Clair. Um, uh, the only, uh, the only, uh, quite frankly, this is the most information I've received. I didn't know um, that much about it. Um, your board is. Um, from what I've been able to look at is um, impressive, um, which is always helpful. Uh, I'm only going to vote for this, though, tonight, in all honesty, um, because it's really only, all we're voting is to move forward so we can have discussions about it, um, which need to happen. Um, I have neighbors that have been in the hockey program for <laughs> forever um, uh, and I've seen them I've seen them leave their house at 430 in the morning religiously to get to those 530 practices um, and when you're uh, in high school and you're a teenager you're you got enough on your plate without having to leave their house at 430 in the morning um, that being said Five and a half million dollars is a lot of money to raise and a lot of money to come up with, um, and I do have I have some concerns, um, but I will vote for this to pass tonight so that we can get to the next stage to see. Um, I agree with some of your questions, Mr. Tripp. We need to get a lot of those questions answered, but I do firmly think that this is a group of individuals that will answer those questions. Okay. You want down this end? <laughs> Councilor Holbrook first. Sure. Um, so I guess I will. A couple quick things. Um, I, I was approached. I think it was about a year ago um, to, to come down and, and kick around the concept of some kind of an ice arena building. Um, and I just want to, I guess, express that that is not unusual for a constituent to call a counselor and say, I mean, I had a phone call this week, somebody was unhappy about their road, and they had a phone call this week about, uh, a couple weeks ago, about, you know, something with the shellfish, and can they meet, and they talk, I mean, that's not an unusual circumstance to happen. Somebody has an idea, they want to pitch it to a counselor, see if it's noteworthy, or see if there's anything to be done about it. Um, I can't say I really recall a, a great amount of detail from, from that meeting because it was a while ago now, um, but it was about a year ago. Um, so I did know about it, in all fairness, I did know about it about a year ago. Um, although my personal thoughts from, from that meeting really haven't changed yet, um, I will say I, I left with the feeling of I, I just don't know if this is a square peg round hole. Um, I know we're talking about hockey, and I, I know that there is certainly a need. Um, but like many things, I, I try to remember when we talk about the municipal campus, highest and best use is what always comes to my mind. And is the highest and the best use of our available space in the municipal campus a solely dedicated building for hockey, or would it be a building somewhere on the campus that is a community center. And um, that would be allow for more activities outside of just the hockey. Um, you know, room for our seniors for the senior center, room um, as much as I applaud you for your efforts of fundraising and, and pulling it together. Um, I do recall quite a while ago some folks trying to pull it together for a pool, which was unsuccessful. So. You know, there are a lot of needs within the community, and, and I do um, appreciate that. But, but again, I'm, I'm still right now at this moment with the view of square peg round hole. So, um, but I look forward to the workshop. I look forward to hearing what you have to say, maybe some other concepts, you know, 
Um, my big concern, too, still remains in the what happens 30 years from now when this building is sitting there next to our high school. Um, you know, the, the problem of our town and the school department right along was that we had this huge boom and we couldn't support the amount of kids we had in our buildings. So I'm also very cautious of how can we expand those schools later when things turn around again and we start facing those building booms again and we start looking at 100 kids rolling in every year in enrollment. Um, so I don't want to cut our nose and spite our face and not be able to expand up there if we need to. Um, so again, I look forward to hearing some more about some, some of these concepts. Okay, thank you. Councilor Donovan. Uh, this is a big idea. I mean, this is, <clears throat> this is not something small that uh, can be uh, dealt with uh, in a, on a more simplistic level. There's a lot of complexity to a project that, that occupies this much space, that involves this kind of infrastructure costs and improvements, that takes up uh, town, municipal campus land. Uh, uh, so I think our responsibility is to uh, look long and hard at all the issues. And, to, uh, and so while anytime someone shows up and says, listen, we'll raise $5.5 million and build the entire facility and uh, uh, afford uh, uh, easy access for our high school teams and our youth soccer and community use, that kind of, your eyes kind of open up and you go, gee, that's terrific. Uh, but there are a lot of questions that need answering. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, uh, and a lot of the comments that we've received so far are, you know, there are other uses, uh, other activities uh, that <clears throat> It has an equally strong appeal to the public, and we're we're custodians of of the, the municipal campus, and so uh, we have to be careful. So we'll 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 approach this thing with a great deal of caution, uh, e even though it's exciting to think that we could add something that would be a wintertime activity, which we all know from last winter was the winter that never ended. This kind of thing can be done in a wonderful way, or it can be done half-baked. Uh, and if we can find a way to do it that uh, sort of fulfills a lot of the needs of the community, uh, then, uh, then we'll all applaud ourselves at the end. But to me, it involves a lot of hard work because the business plan and the operating budget and the protections the town would have if the thing went south are all things that we need to look long and hard at. So mm -hmm. I'm encouraged to, to do the, participate and contribute to the working effort, but it, it's going to take some, some effort on our part. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Well, I'll, um, I'll go just for a minute. Um, like, uh, I have to, like, I guess, piggyback off of what uh, Council Holbrook said. Um, the way that this town has conducted business in the past was that citizens approach councilors and with their ideas, and the councilors forward it to the rest of the council and involve the town manager. Now, a memorandum of understanding, the town of Scarborough's done this lots of times for a long time. You look the proof tonight. Order 1474 was a memorandum of understanding with a with a Fairway Drive. They get the memorandum of understanding, and then they raise the funds to uh, pay the town to uh, have the road accepted and bring the road up to standards. So it's not something that's new. This has been going on for years. It's been done this way. However. Um, with discussion between counselors, um, we've all decided the best thing to do was workshop this, get the answers to the questions so that everybody's satisfied with the process going forward. Um, they still have a huge mountain to climb with raising the money, if that's what the council decides to do. It will be a decision of the council. So with that, 
Um, we'll, uh, I, I think um, that that will end my comments. And Councilor Katarina. Um, like to before I take my motion. Okay, cool. Yep. <laughs> Just a couple of comments. I sent to the group, uh, Friends of Scarborough Hockey, six questions. I'm not going to ask them all tonight. I said I was going to, but I'm not. I will, but I want answers when you come back. Um, I, I think the concept is great. I have a lot of concerns. I would like to see multi-purpose if we're going to do something, you know, for those, instead of it just sitting empty and not used in the summer, are there other uses? Um, I I'm, don't like the location, but that's me, and I've got all sorts of reasons for that. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but, you know, that being said, I move to table this until October 15th with a workshop. Would you talk about the workshop October 1st? Yes. So I'm uh, putting that out as, as a motion to table until October 15th. The MOU second. order, whatever it is, 1476. Second. All those in favor? That's it. Okay. Non-action items. None. There are none. Standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. We'll start with uh, Councilor St. Clair. Uh, the only thing I had to talk about tonight was the ordinance committee, and I think we pretty much <laughs> beat that to <laughs> as much as we possibly could. So I am good. Thank you. Councilor Benedict. <coughs> um, the clamming industry down at uh, Pine Point had a meeting and have decided to close specific areas, three specific areas, uh, for the month of January and February to help the little baby clams grow the seeds. And uh, it took some understanding and some conversation, but they did come to that agreement that they'll, they'll close them and no one will be allowed in the three specific areas that they have. Uh, that's about the extent of it. Okay, thank you. Councilor Katarina. I don't have anything. Councilor Donovan. No, I, th I think our next finance committee meeting is September 16th for those who would be interested in attending. Council Holbrook. Um, so yeah, a couple recaps. So um, Housing Alliance will be Thursday, September 4th at 6.30. I'm sure there'll be um, some discussion on the TIF that was passed here in first reading and, and still have some um, second reading to go, but I'm sure they'll be discussing that. Um, there will be an update on the Broad Turn Road Habitat Project and um, they will be continuing to, to look through, um, they're looking through the current process of how um, affordable housing is addressed and um, its location and what we have for programming and trying to maybe reevaluate it a bit and try to work through the process to make it a little easier and more streamlined because it can be a little confusing on how to, mm. You know, how does somebody qualify? And how does the developer utilize it? So they're trying to put it together as maybe a kind of a package so that um, folks can, you know, have a pamphlet or something that helps walk through them a little bit. Um, historic preservation meets September 2nd at 6.30. Um, right now they're still going through the process of site visits um, with the cemeteries. Um, and then in I I don't have a firm date on this, but they're hoping for um, September to have an upcoming um, property owners meeting so they can do some outreach um, on some of the um, owners that have either a site or a monument or a home that, that's already fairly, you know, known as being um, historic or something that's, you know, really old or interesting. And um, like I said, to have a homeowners and interested parties meeting so just kind of gather some information from them. Um, and like Bill mentioned, finance is meeting on Tuesday, September 16th at 8.30 a.m. That should be a joint meeting with um, the school department just to discuss some of the uh, fiscal year. And as you know, fiscal year and year year are a little different. So um, they, we have reached our fiscal year end at this point. So they're going to discuss and go over some of those numbers with us as well as um, continue to work on um, town manager Tom Hall has been carefully and 
meticulously trying to tease out all the things that are shared services and to quantify what the cost is for that. And um, so again, um, we should be probably looking over that again and also having a little bit of discussion on um, what things would have um, perhaps an opportunity for uh, if we had an outside company come in and, and do and what that cost would be to make sure that we're, you know, spending money appropriately and for what service, for instance, um, we do have school resource officers um, that's paid for out of the municipal side of the budget. We have two officers, one at the high school, one at the middle school. If we were to contract with the security company, what would that look like and what type of service would we be getting and, and those sorts of things. Um, and then also, um, I just wanted to make as a side uh, two quick notes. Appointments committee will need to meet prior to the next council meeting, just to let you know. So um, we have a couple applicants there. And on the note of um, appointments, there are several openings and vacancies on numerous committees. Um, so if you are interested at all in serving on a committee here in town, um, we have openings on assessment review, cable TV, coastal waters and harbor. Um, community Services and Rec, uh, Housing Alliance, Historic Preservation, the Personal Appeals Board, the Pest Management Advisory Committee, the Senior Programming, and the Zoning Board of Appeals all have openings. So again, if you have any interest in perhaps serving your community or being a little more involved, um, you can always get an application online through our website or through the clerk's office. And that's it. Okay. I have nothing to report um, for committee reports. Um, we'll go to uh, councillor comments. Councillor. Oh, I'm sorry. Managers report. I'm pleased to have you skip over me if you like. <laughs> <laughs> no, a couple of quick things. Uh, some good news, I think. Uh, the assessor, uh, as of yesterday, committed taxes for uh, this, this fiscal year. Uh, the good news with that is, based on our projections at budget time, we were projecting a mill rate of $15.20, which was a, equated to a 2.9% increase in tax rate. Once he finalized the tax commitment, the actual tax rate will be and is $15.10, so it came down $0.10 cents from what was projected, and that equates to about a 2.23% increase in the tax rate. Um, still something we need to be mindful of, but I think that's certainly good news. The real difference there is that we had been projecting a $15 million increase in value, uh, whereas in the end it came in closer to 40. There's a number of factors associated with that. Uh, CMP's distribution system was picked up for the first time. They made some major upgrades to their system through town. Uh, we we're also able to negotiate uh, some deferment of tax deferred pro tax exempt property for Maine Medical Center and Maine Health, uh, which has helped us. Uh, so we're really pleased to report that to the council. Also, I just want to update. Um, I did speak with the officials at the land trust. The Benjamin Farm pro project is moving forward very nicely. They still have a lot of work to do. They're over just over halfway to their fundraising goal, uh, and that's a goal initial goal of five hundred thousand. The other interesting thing, just to note on that project, uh, they have rekindled discussions with IFNW regarding uh, potentially designating some area of that property uh, for cottontail habitat. And what comes with that is, uh, is financial support. Um, you might recall any financial support they receive goes uh, to reduce the $2 million request to the town. Uh, so those. Uh, They've assured us that they will involve the town in any final decisions in that regard, but uh, I thought it was interesting and wanted to relate that to you that they're back at the table uh, talking with those folks. Uh, we've also, we are underway with a Dunstan revitalization plan. This is something that kind of uh, was not planned with, with, with much forethought. Uh, it really came to us by way of the Griffin Road project. Um, as was mentioned earlier, there's a, a fairly complicated and regimented uh, application and scoring system. One of the ways to get additional points is um, a revitalization plan uh, in the area where the project is, is um, proposed. And the town staff and, and SEDCO saw the value in partnering with them um, with a real focus on implementation of uh, some of the new zoning and, and economic development in Dunstan. So we're we're excited that that project is underway with, with their partnership. Uh, and two more quick things.
some of you perhaps have heard from residents of Longmeadow uh, Road. Uh, Public Works uh, has provided a maintenance treatment. It's essentially it's called a rubberized asphalt chip seal process. So rather than the conventional uh, overlay, tar overlay, asphalt uh, um, uh, approach, this uh, is a is a almost a boiling hot rubberized asphalt that goes down on the street, and then three inch inch um, gravel is applied directly to this hot asphalt. Uh, it's rolled, then it's swept, so all the loose stones are picked up. Um, but it does provide a different texture. It's a rougher surface, as you might imagine, than a smooth road. And we chose Long Meadow, I should say they chose it, uh, because it's a residential connector street. It connects through from Broad Turn Road uh, all the way to Holmes Road. Mm -hmm. uh, the park is, is kind of midpoint, and so it's an attractive point. And the other factor is, though the road was built in 1994, uh, it's still in very good shape, and this sort of a, uh, maintenance treatment is is only sensible on roads that uh, don't have severe structural damage. And um, it's a proven method uh, that's used uh, throughout the country. Uh, we don't have much experience in Scarborough, and so we are. Uh, it's certainly not an experimental treatment, but we're show we're having some experience for the first time. So I encourage you all to take a drive, get out and and walk the road just to get a sense of what um, what the feel of that is and we're interested in your inputs. And lastly, the town did receive a dividend from our uh, insurance pool that we're part of. On the workers' comp side, we received a dividend of $29,424. And on the property casualty side, $10,670. So uh, that uh, is in demonstration of our good experience and, and, low, um, and, and, and low losses, if you will. So that's always good news to have dividends returned to the town. And certainly available for questions if you have any. No? So you no. Good. Okay, now we'll move on to Council of Commons. So we'll start with Councillor Holbrook. So I do have um, up at where we only meet once in the month. So um, I do have a bit of a list um, for our council condolences to those in our community that have since passed on. Um, so we'll start with Walter Ballou, William Bucallery, Doris Burt, Beverly LaPointe Crawford, Sarah Elizabeth Parker Denton, Rushton Howard Harewood Jr., Betty Hersom, William Leo, Kenneth Libby, Walter McCurch, Irvin Maris, I can't read my writing, sorry, Marisu, Alta Reeds, Agatha Cummings Rogers, Len Lenore Jean Sandberg, Helen Sylvester, Pauline Sylvester, Norman Bellevue, Mary Voorhees, Merlin White, and I did get a name passed on to me this evening, um, Roberta Mayetta. Um, and as you might know, Mayetta um, Construction has done a lot here in Scarborough. Um, so again, just to offer our condolences to the families of, of those in our community. And um, just two comments for me. Um, the first one is, um, again, the clink bags um, for our fuel assistance program that we do with um, Project Grace are available in the clerk's office, and feel free to grab some and fill them up and drop them off, because we like to raise as much money as we can for the fuel assistance program, and um, just to have a happy and safe Labor Day weekend. Thank you. Councilor Donovan. Yes. Councilor Katerina. Uh, just very quickly, I have started working with our town manager on looking at a communications policy for the town, uh, how we can better improve making sure everything gets posted to the website and whatever is available to people is more readily available. Uh, I think it will make people feel more comfortable. So I am going to work with Tom on that and I thank him for that. Um, and just as to let people know too, I would still like to see the town council and the school board improve communications and early, early in the, in the uh, efforts as we are looking towards a new school year. So that's it for me. Okay. 
Council of Benedict. School people. I just have one thing that uh, to throw out. Uh, I'd like to commend Chief Moulton. Uh, there's a fairly large uh, item going around right now. It's the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. And <clears throat> Chief Moulton came right out in the, the parking lot over there with seven or eight other police officers. And as most of the time, he was in his jacket and his tie and his white shirt, dressed the way he normally is, and he took it like a champ, and he stood there, and he got absolutely soaked. So I just wanted to commend him on that. That, that, that to me, is leading by showing Thank you, Chief. Just if I could add to that, that was nothing compared to him shaving his head the month before. So he, right. he is oh, the right. team player all the way around. <laughs> yes. Okay, Council of St. Clair. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Now that ice bucket challenge, um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that works yet. Oh. Me either. <laughs> you better watch that. Get it. I I mean, hey, if they're going to donate $500, I'll take it. My kids have done it. <laughs> That's not quite the way it works. I don't but, think uh, it you works might find way. out when you get home tonight. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I think Doug, Doug. I, one oh, yes. one thing that I was reminded of the uh, Finance Committee is, uh, and Councilor Katarina's comment about efforts to improve communication, uh, we are going to meet with the uh, school boards. Uh, finance director, uh, Kate Holton, uh, mm -hmm. Holton. 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 on uh, September 16th. So this is all a part of continuing to try and mm -hmm. communicate effectively, and, and I really think that uh, our town manager and our chairman need to be applauded because all the things we've gotten done this year really have been as a result of a great team effort, and, uh, and I really think that people should recognize uh, what an effective the communications program uh, you've initiated. So this is all part of our effort to, to be uh, better communication, in better communications with the town, with the school, uh, since they play such an important part of our budget. All right. Um, and then uh, my condolences goes out to um, all that were mentioned. A lot of, a uh, couple of the names I was uh, shocked. I didn't know they had passed away. Um, and, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, Council Blaze was out because of uh, family commitment, so he wasn't able to attend tonight. He's pretty good at attendance, so um, we'll let it go that time, this time. <laughs> so <laughs> with that, we have a uh, another order. Could I just add one more thing, please? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that nomination papers are available in the clerk's mm -hmm. office. Uh, you can pick them up anytime during regular business hours for the town council, board of education, and the sanitary district, and they would have to be returned by close of business on Wednesday, September 3rd. So with that, I'll read the next one. Thank okay. you. Okay. Order number 1477 is move approval on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title I of the Maine Revised Statute, subsection 4056A, 6C, regarding a real estate matter. We have a motion. So moved. Thank All you. those in favor? Aye. Thank you. It'll be quick, I promise. Not to. 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 Not to.